Hello, I'm Dr. Austin. You're welcome to today's video. In this video, I'll be talking about the kinetic theory of gases. Now, the kinetic theory is a theory that describes the behavior of matter. It talks about the fact that matter is made up of particles and that these particles are in continuous motion. Of course, to be in continuous motion, the particles must possess kinetic energy. But narrowing it down to gases, the kinetic theory of gases, we talk about the postulates, the assumptions of the kinetic theory of gases. It's very important that we know them, that we're able to mention them. So I'm going to list the postulates of the kinetic theory of gases. The first one talks about the fact that gas molecules are in a continuous random motion. So the molecules of a gas are not fixed like those of a solid. Instead, they move continuously, exhibiting what type of motion? Random motion. And this random motion is along straight lines. And they do so colliding with one another in the process, as well as with the walls of the container. Now, let's take a simple illustration. Imagine that we had a room and we had um, children within that room, maybe five, six children blindfolded and then given a command to run very quickly in any direction they choose. As these children run, what will you see? They will run randomly because they can't see where they are running to. And as they run, what do we find happening? The children will collide either with each other or, what do you find again? They collide with the wall of the room. So in like manner, when gas molecules are in a container, they move, yes, and as they move, they collide with one another and with the walls of the container. So there are two collisions at work here. Gas to gas collision and gas to wall collision. Now, gas to wall collision is more important in the sense that that is what accounts for the pressure of a gas. So gases exert pressure on the walls of their container. Gas to gas collision does not account for gas pressure. So just in case you come across that question, what accounts for gas pressure? Gas to wall collisions. Okay, having said so, the second assumption of the kinetic theory is, as these gas molecules collide, they do so without losing energy. Now the classical way of stating that is, the collisions of the gas molecules are perfectly elastic. Now, each time you hear that, the message that is being passed is, as the molecules collide with one another, they do not lose total energy. Now, see what that means. Let's say this is a gas molecule, that's a gas molecule, and this another gas molecule. If this gas molecule is moving with, uh, let's say it has kinetic energy of 10 Newton, uh, sorry, 10 joules, kinetic energy, and this one also has kinetic energy of 10 joules, and then they collide. By the time they collide, one of them could slow down while the other becomes faster. So let's say after collision here, this now moves in that direction with a new energy, kinetic energy of 5 joules, whereas this moves in that direction with a new kinetic energy of 15 joules. So you see that before collision, their total kinetic energy was 20 joules, and after collision, it remained 20 joules. So the total kinetic energy, which is the same as average kinetic energy in a sense, are usually the same, it remains constant. Now, in this other case, this gas molecule may collide against a wall, that's the wall of the container. Assuming this gas molecule had 10 joules before that collision, after bouncing off the wall, it will still retain 10 joules. That means in every respect, Despite these many collisions, the total energy within that system remains the same. Now the third assumption of the kinetic theory. The kinetic theory assumes, in the third case, that the total space occupied by the gas molecules is negligible. The total space occupied by the gas molecules themselves is negligible. What does that mean? Imagine the six children we talked about before inside one big room. How much space can those children really take? Well, if they spread out all around the room, they seem to occupy the whole room. 
But what if they gather on one corner of the room, then you see that they occupy very little space. Again, look at this illustration. These are gas molecules. You see how far apart they are. Now, because the gas molecules are able to spread, yes, they will occupy the whole container. But imagine that these gas molecules were to collapse on one another. If they were to collapse, they would end up occupying this space, all five of them in this space. And that tells you that the actual space occupied by the gas molecules is actually negligible. Then the fourth assumption of the kinetic theory says that the intermolecular forces of attraction between the gas molecules are negligible. And that is clearly seen here. If these gas molecules were very strongly attracted together, they would not be this far apart. But they are far apart now simply because the forces holding them are very weak. They are negligible. Then the last one is a very important statement. I'll write it here as number five. It says, the temperature of a gas is a measure of the average kinetic energy of its molecules. Now, the simple meaning of this is when the temperature of a gas is high, it means that the average kinetic energy of its molecules will also be high and vice versa. It's a direct statement, it's a past question. Jam Y has asked it severally. Now, having stated the postulates of the kinetic theory, I'd like to talk about four parameters that we use to describe the behavior of gases. These four parameters are pressure, volume, temperature, and amount. Amount of gas, number of moles of gas, we represent it by the symbol N. Volume, volume is V, pressure is P, and temperature is T. So those are the four parameters that we use to describe gases. Now the first one, pressure. I said somewhere in this video that the pressure of a gas is simply um, as a result of the collisions between the gas molecules and the wall of their container. Now it's very important to know what units pressure could take. Pressure could have units including millimeters of mercury, which is by far the commonest. Then we also have pressure measured in Torricelli. Torricelli is written as tall for short. Now, millimeters of mercury and Torricelli are equivalent units in that one millimeter of mercury is one Torricelli. Then we also have Pascals written as PA and we have Newton per meter square. These are also equivalent units in that one Pascal is one Newton per meter square. And then finally, we have this unit for pressure. I'm sure you are very familiar with it, the atmospheres. So these are possible units for pressure of a gas. Then there's another pressure called vapor pressure. I'll talk about it in the next video when I talk about the gas laws. But for now, the next parameter is volume. The volume occupied by a gas is, if you look at this case now, we said it before that the actual volume is somewhere around here, but this is the apparent volume. So this is what we refer to as volume of a gas, how far it spreads. Now, possible units for volume include um, dm cube. dm cube is cubic decimeter, and it is equivalent to the liter. So one liter and one dm cube are the same. Then we also have what we call the cubic centimeter, cm cube, and that is equivalent to milliliters ml. So one ml, one milliliter, one mil is one cm cube. And then there's another unit that is written as meter cube. Now one meter cube is 1000 dm cube which is also 1,000 liters, all right? So meter cube is also a recognized unit for volume. Now what about amount of substance? That one is straightforward. The amount of any substance is measured in moles. Then finally, we have a temperature to talk about. Temperature of a gas 
can be measured in any of these two standard units. Degrees of Celsius, also called degrees centigrade, and Kelvin. Now, the Kelvin um, does not take the degree symbol. If you're writing Kelvin, you write Kelvin. So we can have 50 degrees Celsius, but we can have 50 degrees Kelvin. What we have is 50 Kelvin. It doesn't take the degree sign. Now, the Celsius scale, the Kelvin scale, are two recognized temperature scales, and it's possible to interconvert between those scales using a very simple formula, which is the temperature in degrees Celsius, when 273 is added to it, becomes a temperature in Kelvin. But what if I had a temperature in Kelvin and I'm to change it to a temperature in degrees Celsius? Yes, I'll just need to subtract 273 and it becomes a temperature in degrees Celsius. So these are the two common values. But for calculations purposes in chemistry, any calculation question at all, just know that once you write T to mean temperature, then the value you will impute must be in Kelvin. So even if you are given a question and the temperature is in degrees Celsius, you must add 273 to it first to make it a temperature in Kelvin, and then you use the value for your calculations. Thank you very much for watching this video. The next video will be on the